you guys can all see my screen? Yes. Cool. All, right. all right. So um, I know the title <clears throat> of this is Finding and Altering Implementing, Finding, Altering, and Implementing Low Floor High Ceiling Tasks in a Middle School Classroom. Um, that's what I worked a lot on this summer, and that's what I've been doing a lot of in my classroom this year, but um, I do a lot more than that. Um, so I just wanted to be clear that there's going to be a lot more that I'm talking about today. Um, that is the first thing I'm going to talk about since it is the title of today's um, meeting, but I, I just want to be really clear moving forward that there's some other things I'm going to talk about. So. This is what I'm going to try to cover today. I apologize for the slow start. Um, as you can see, there's lots of pieces and I was hoping to just like keep it moving. Sort of like my class is actually about the same length of professional development. So um, I was just going to try to view like through my class and uh, like momentum sort of thing that I try to keep in my classroom because an hour and 40 minutes is how long my class periods are, and that's a, it's a pretty daunting time period, um, especially for some middle schoolers. So uh, we're gonna talk about low floor high ceiling tasks, of course, but then I'm gonna talk about my personal vision as a middle school math teacher, and then I'm gonna talk about the most important thing that I took away from PCMI this summer. Um, and, and I'm gonna share with you how I do Classroom 360, which PCMI called Vertical Non-Permanent Spaces. And uh, I'm also going to share about how I'm trying to refuse to lecture this year. And that's um, with the help of technology, of course. Um, and if we have time, hopefully I can show you a couple amazing things on the web that you may know about and you may not know about. Um, and if you don't know about it, they're pretty awesome. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just introductions and um, a short little discussion, basically answering these five prompts. Um, so maybe I'll give everybody like a minute to get their responses ready. And then maybe Elizabeth, can you uh, like call on people to share out? Okay, I'll kind of go in order of how I see. I don't know if everybody's video shows up the same order as mine on my screen, but that's, I guess, the order I'll go in. So, Irene, you'll be next. Uh, I'm Liz McGrath. I actually teach at SUNY Broome, which is a community college in upstate New York. I teach mostly remedial math, so it's lower than Algebra 2 trig that I taught in high school for the last 14 years. Um, my school is, since it's a community college and school, it is a very diverse. We have a lot of that transfer up and come up from inner city areas. So that's kind of fun. Uh, and I am loving winter and wishing I had more snow. Uh, and I'm so excited that Sam's here to do this talk. I've been looking forward to it. All right, Irene. Hello, can you hear me guys? Yes. No? Yes, okay. I thought, okay. Uh, last year I taught ad adult ed students, right? I went to uh, Mid Manhattan Adult Learning Center to teach adults, and then I went back to my middle school. So it was surprising that the way adults learn is just like the same as middle schoolers. <laughs> and now I'm teaching six, seven, eight. It's kind of a lot of work because I have three preparations. I have to do regions, and then I have to do sixth grade math. So really, this low ceiling to high ceiling, you know, being able to solve problems is really a need for me because I'm dealing with three different things and it drives me crazy. <coughs> and it's like, I thought it would be easy because I was like, oh, it's gonna be good because I'll be learning three things, but I realized it's not the opportunity of learning three things. It's like eating you, it's like, exhausting you because of the preparation and the pressure and you're doing three different things at the same time and it drives me crazy oh which worksheet am i going to use this time oh wait wait i put this oh what's the next class oh six seven eight it drives me crazy this is not a good way to really give a teacher a loading and now i realize how those teachers you know what difficulties they're coping with when they're given three different things and teaching them 
I don't know they'll be able to really teach with, you know, high, uh, with high quality. It's not. You cannot have high quality teaching when you have three or you have many things preparing before you teach. It drives you crazy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Jen? Um, my, my name is Jenna Smende. I teach at Wagenheim Middle School, which is in San Diego. Um, I teach mostly seventh, but I also have um, a group of accelerated seven and um, in grade one. And um, the thing about my school is that they're finally putting air conditioning. So I'm looking forward to when we have summertime and we get to stay in our classrooms and it's nice and cool. And um, the one thing about myself is that um, I'm teaching at the middle school that I actually went to as a middle schooler. So it's pretty neat. Awesome, thanks Jen. Ian? Hi everybody, I'm Ann Paoletti. Um, I teach in South Jersey outside of Philadelphia and I teach seventh grade math. Um, something about my school, I, this is the first school I've taught at. I, I've taught in Boston and I taught in upstate New York. Actually, that's how Liz and I know each other. We taught together in upstate New York. Um, but this place where I teach now, it's the first school where I've actually taught students who were super well behaved and really want to learn. It's, it's amazing. They come to school and they all want to learn and they say thank you after every lesson, even when I yell at them. So it, it's, it's magical and it's, it's so exciting. And I have a great group of kids this year um, and I'm just enjoying it because, you know, some, some years are harder than others, but this is a great year. Um, and then a little thing about myself, I, I went to PCMI in 2015 and 2016 and I applied to go again this summer. So I'm just, you know, going to wait to find out if, if I'm accepted in, but um, I'm so excited about the thought of spending another three weeks doing this because I love it. Awesome. Tracy? Um, I'm Tracy Jackson. I um, in, am in San Diego. I teach eighth grade math, integrated one, and new this year, integrated two online. So that's been an interesting journey for me to try to create a collaborative problem solving based class uh, online. So discussion boards and things like that. So that's been my, that's been my baby this year. That's where most of my time goes. Cool. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, Diana? Hi, Diana McLean. Um, I teach seventh and eighth grade math at, in Los Angeles, California. And something else about my school is that there is a lot of challenges outside of my classroom that affect my classroom. <laughs> but I'm doing my best. Cool. Uh, Brian? Hi, I'm Brian. Uh, I teach at the International High School of Prospect Heights in um, basically central Brooklyn. This year I'm actually teaching 12th graders computer science. Um, it's an interesting <clears throat> change of pace. Um, my school is also all English language learners, uh, uh, which is also sort of um, one of the inherent challenges at my school. And uh, I'm interested in this low floor, high ceiling task thing because I've been pondering how to implement stuff like that in a computer science classroom too, so. Cool, uh, Christina? Hello, um, I don't, does the video show online? Can you hear me though? I, you can hear me, right? Okay, that's good. I, I don't know what the thing is with Zoom. It didn't work the first time when we did the small group stuff either. But um, so uh, Christina Jimenez, um, I'm at uh, in San Diego also. It looks like we have some good San Diego representatives. I see my roomie, I see uh, another Math for America person. Um, so I'm at Albert Einstein there. I teach sixth grade math there. Um, it's an international baccalaureate school um, with sixth through eighth. Uh, so that's the middle school. Something about myself, um, I don't think I actually told this to like, almost anybody while I was there, but during PCMI I was pregnant and I just had a, a baby 12, 12 days ago. So adjusting to that and like being a mother and all. So that's like a big thing for me. Awesome, congrats, that's so exciting. Uh, Marissa? Hi, um, I teach in Illinois, actually in the Illinois, Iowa border called the Quad Cities. Um, I teach freshmen mostly. Um, I, 
I do honors math two and then just regular integrated math one. Um, something interesting about my school is we have a really high refugee population for some reason. I don't know why they come to Illinois, Iowa, but um, they, that means that I have a lot of students or a good chunk of students who like never had school until they came here maybe this year or a couple of years ago or um, I, we have like about 50 different languages spoken in my school. Um, so it creates a challenge, but it's also fun to work with those kinds of kids. And then about myself, um, kind of like Elizabeth, uh, I was enjoying winter and now it's like 50 degrees here for some reason and it's really messing with me. So I'm sorry if I sound a little under the weather. <laughs> you feel better soon, Marissa. Uh, Naira? So, um, I'm Naira. I teach with Sam at Barenda Middle School. I teach six, seven, eight, accelerated, and algebra. So, and I was I was at PCMI last summer. Mm, that's it. So I, I work with Sam most of the time. So that's it. And Naira probably wins the prep award because she has four preps. <laughs> wow. Sorry. A lot of prep. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. But Frank? I can see what, what just happened. Hi. Oh, I, uh, oh, I see. Okay. It was, I was on the wrong screen. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, I went to, uh, I attended PCMI in 2013, and I live in San Diego. I, I, I'm my te high school teacher in San Diego Unified, and I know Christina and Jen through the Math for America program down here. Um, Jen and I are still working um, together on another program and we have shared a lot of information and she's been really helping me keep up of PCMI uh, follow-up activities. So really appreciate that. Um, this year I'm on loan to San Diego State University in Sweetwater uh, High School Union School District and um, we got a grant uh, for only about 23 months to work with uh, Sweetwater uh, developing the discrete math curriculum and we're piloting, helping the teachers implementing the uh, curriculum. So hopefully this, uh, when this ends in September, the curriculum will be available for you know, any district, school district to you. It will be an open source curriculum through the California Department of Education. So I'm very excited about that. And if anyone is interested or have you know, knowledge about discrete math, um, or even, you know, not discrete math, but student thinking in general. I really appreciate any resources that you uh, know of. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. And finally, our presenter, Sam. All right, <clears throat> so I teach at Brenda Middle School with Naira. Um, I've taught there my whole career, um, which is not super long, so 13 years. Um, I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, I teach an algebra class as well. Um, something about my school is that like, I really love it. I feel super lucky to have been in one spot for my whole career. Um, yeah, like I'm very happy at home as well. Um, but like, I'm really happy going to work every day. So it's really nice. Um, and something about myself is that <clears throat> I am also a, I have like a one and a half year old, and um, I'm really digging being a dad. So that's, that's something else. So I'm going to get right into it because I know I want to respect everybody's time. And I did work really hard on this, and I really want to try to get to everything. Um, so the first thing is I just want to be really clear that um, Elizabeth or PCMI, like no one has double checked all of like this PD or even looked at it. So if I say something during the PD that you really don't agree with or like strikes you as um, just something that you really don't agree with, uh, please take it out on me and not PCMI um, because um, this, this PCMI really helped me grow as a teacher, but um, this PD is mine. So once again, if, if you don't agree with pieces of it or the whole thing, then um, then I'm the person you need to complain to and write angry emails to. Um, so I was going to try to pull some people into signing up for PCMI, but unless I'm mistaken, I think every single person that at least shared out 
um, what already attended PCMI. So I won't go into details about that, but if there's somebody that's logged on right now and watching or somebody that's watching this PD later, um, there is a link to the website and PCMI is uh, an amazing three week experience uh, and you should definitely apply. Okay, so let's get right into the title, right? Altering low floor, high ceiling tasks. So I'm just gonna go ahead and show you an example of a uh, low floor, what I consider a low floor, high ceiling task that I altered for my students. And this is one that, that they have not worked on. So um, I start with a warm up, and the, the point of this warm up is to sort of front load some knowledge or make sure that my students remember some things that they possibly would have forgotten. And in this case, that would be the area of the circle and the volume of a cylinder. And then more specifically, how are they related? As in, um, hopefully when they start to look at pictures of circles and pictures of cylinders, they can see the relationship between the two. Um, during this part of class, I really push my students to their resources to find answers. And um, I am one-to-one -one in my classroom with Chromebooks. Um, and, and I really try to show my students all of the knowledge that is uh, on the internet for them to find. So during this part, um, a lot of my kids are searching up images, circles, and, um, and cylinders, and maybe they're even writing down uh, formulas, um, and they're just really reminding themselves of some of that geometry that they need for this lesson, or this, um, this stimulus, actually. So here's the, the, the stimulus. So I, uh, I have, like I guess all of you guys probably now too, I have like an online version of my textbook. Um, and I like to go in there and screenshot um, things like this little bird feeder here. Um, and I use the what you notice, what you wonder um, that I got from Annie Fetter. And I know a lot of, a lot of people use those prompts to sort of promote discourse before my students get into this low floor, high ceiling task. Um, while the students are, while I'm facilitating the discussion, I have three kids live script um, the discussion. So once again, we're all one-to-one -one Chromebooks in my class. I open a Google slide, I make this on a Google slide. And the Google slide is shared with the entire class to view. And then I give three students the special setting to be able to um, edit that Google slide, which means that they can type in it. Um, this is actually something I know a lot of people said they, they're an MFA and I'm sure a lot of you guys go to all sorts of professional developments. I mean, the fact that you're here on Saturday morning looking at your computer, listening to me shows that you like learning and figuring, seeing new stuff. Um, and one thing I noticed at MFA is that we do a lot of live scripting um, when we do discussions. So I really stole that from, from how we do discussions at MFA. And it's really cool and it works out really well. We're gonna look at an example of a finished one next. But um, what you notice, I love, in case you don't do what you notice and what you wonder, um, that's the low floor. So it really levels your class, as in every kid can notice something here. You just need to be really clear and transparent about your expectations. And my expectations are like, so chill. Like you can notice that, uh, this is green, and I notice there's an arrow going up and down, right? But somebody will notice that there's 24 IN, and somebody will say, oh, I think 24 IN means 24 inches. Um, someone will notice that this is H, and a, uh, a uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a measure that we don't know. That's why we're using a variable. So if you, uh, if you push and facilitate the discussion right, um, a lot of students will notice things that maybe like, seven or eight years ago, I would have like, been dismissive about. Um, like once again, like if somebody said, uh, the bird feeder is green at the top. I feel like eight years ago, I would have been like, yeah, but let's talk about math. Um, and I don't do that now, right? Because that kid is looking at the bird feeder and the whole class is concentrating on this stimulus and talking about what they notice. And when we're done with what you notice, we move on to what you wonder and, um, that's a little different than what you notice because these are things that you're once again wondering about. Um, and you get a really good discourse um, from the students. 
And then depending on what I want to do, I'll be completely honest. So um, I feel like I'm pretty good at the, the low floor. And then I think I'm pretty good at the high ceiling, which I'll talk about how I do that in a, in a minute. But um, what I'm not great is like having wide open tasks yet. So I do want to be very honest with you guys about that because I feel like low floor, high ceiling is also tied into um, that idea of open tasks. And um, I feel like my tasks are not like wide open by any means yet, as you'll see on this slide, because I really wanted my students to be able to um, <clears throat> be able to make this, sorry, use this equation to figure out all of the different possible volumes based on um, the amount of bird seed in this case that is missing. So this piece is optional, right? Depending on how open you want it to be. Um, for this class, I really wanted them to be able to like collect a bunch of different data based on um, the measure of H. Um, but one thing I want to point out for this problem, so like this to me is a very like uh, common core problem in that I feel like when I first started teaching, it would have been 24 inches. And then they would have told us like H would have been the height of the bird seed. And um, during the course of the discussion, it's really clear that that H is the amount of bird seed that is missing in the cylinder. Um, so that really, that's a really, I feel like the most important thing I get from the what you notice, what you wonder um, discussion, that the stimulus is very clear and everybody agrees on the facts that, that are given before we go into the problem. So next, um, I wanted to show you another one. So this is an actual Google slide for my students. Um, it, this one is um, just an, a word problem from the book, except I don't have the problem, right? So Renoa is starting a babysitting business. She spent $26 on signs for advertising. She charges an initial fee of $5 and then $3 for each hour of service. Um, so then I think the book has like a question next, right? Like how much would, how long will it take for Renoa to pay back her $26 or I don't even remember what the question is because um, I don't really care, I'll be honest. Um, <clears throat> but my students, as you can see, I have three different boxes down here for the three different students that are live scripting. The reason why I do three students is because my students are not the fastest typers and it um, really takes the pressure off of them because they know they're recording a comment and they have like maybe a minute or two before they have to record their next comment. So you can see that um, I made sure that we noticed all of the major information that we need from this slide before I let the discussion move on to what you wonder. So we noticed how much she spent, $26. We know that she charges $3 every hour. And we know that $5 is the initial fee. And even though the students didn't live script every single thing we talked about, we definitely made sure that all of that stuff was very clear to all the students in the room, right, to each other, what $26 spent on advertising means in the real world or in, in terms of this problem. Um, next, we move on to what you wonder. Um, so here's sort of fun um, because the kids will wonder funny things like why is she charging such a low rate? Um, why is she doing a babysit, why is she starting a babysitting business? Um, I know they typed area here. Um, I've, I'm not really sure the word that they were trying to type, but, um, but we definitely, I remember having a good discussion about profitable and what it means to be profitable um, during this part of class. Um, the last part, this slide said, what questions can we make? And I do that sometimes, as in what you notice, you are gathering our information, what questions can you, uh, what, what you wonder, like what are you curious about? But what questions can you make is like what actual math questions can you create that can be answered from this stimulus? Um, so they start with, you know, some pretty simple stuff like plugging in, plugging and chugging type of problems. Um, and then as you can see, five and six were my target for this lesson. And I didn't, I didn't say those questions, the students did, but I'll be honest that I did have to sort of like um, facilitate the discussion to make sure that somebody said um, those two statements um, that
that how could we use this information to make an equation and also how could we use it to make an inequality. Um, so those uh, were once again like my, my targets for that um, discussion and I wanted to make sure all the students could take that word problem and model it in equation form. <clears throat> So here's how to get started. In case you don't do any low floor, high ceiling tasks, I think that honestly the easiest thing to do is just go to the story problems or, um, or better yet, if you have like a newer textbook that has lots of things, once again, like a digital version you can screenshot, um, try to get some of those images and um, other stimuli to, that can promote your students' creativity when, um, when working on these types of problems um, and then just don't use the question, right? So just give them like the data from the problem without the question. Um, I really once again like to use that what you notice what you wonder for my whole class discussion and I think that's really key beforehand. And then once again, I like to use the warm up to help students remember key information. And sometimes if there's like a specific thing that I want to make sure they, they're all going to do off of this stimuli, I'll do like a whole, like more of a procedural like problem set, like maybe three to five problems, um, even before the warm up or after the warm up that once again, is sort of like priming their brain in the right direction that I want them to be thinking. Um, I guess the, 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 what I would consider mathematics that efficiently lends itself to figuring out this type of problem. Um, so yeah, so that's how I'd like to get, uh, that's how I would suggest to get started in case you haven't done this. And I'll be honest, like when you guys, when we shared out, I remember a lot of you guys from the summer, of course, and I know a lot of you guys were returning participants. So some of you guys may be better at this than me. I just want to be very clear about that as well. Um, so I think level two of these is like having, um, like really knowing my kids and having multiple pushes prepared. And when I say push, I mean like pushing that ceiling higher and higher. So for instance, um, like on the last problem where they were using Renoa's babysitting business to create an equation, um, that, you know, like perhaps I'm going to push them to graphing that next or, um, I would like you to graph that and interpret three data points on that graph. Um, so, I, so those pushes are pushing that ceiling higher and higher for students that um, are prepared for more and more. Um, use visual patterns. Um, it, you could use the website visual patterns or you could just use visual patterns that you find um, and other stimuli that don't have numbers or variables. So similar to the bird feeder problem, it did have some numbers on there um, and it also has some variables, but sort of like that, like it's in um, stimuli that the students can use um, and I think it helps them attach to realia right away. Um, and then the third one is like open it way up. And once again, like I'm not really there yet, I'll be honest, but I've watched a lot of videos and stuff and um, um, I think somebody may have their microphone on. Cool. Okay. Um, here's why to do those low floor, high ceiling tasks. So if you, if you're like on the fence about it and you're not sure, um, if I should try it or not, I suggest trying it. Right. So once again, they're great at promoting that class discourse, which, is I think still my weakest part as a teacher. Like when I reflect on videos that I take of myself and, and just on my days, I think that's still what I'm, I'm worse at, um, worst at, excuse me, but I think it is one of the most important things. Like, so I know I need to get better at it. Um, these problems are super easy to differentiate. So once again, like get that low floor. And then if you're, if you have the time, prepare those pushes. Um, and it's really easy to differentiate these problems. Um, many of the students are least comfortable doing any problem that has English. So I know I heard like Brian say he's got English learners. Um, I think it was um, Marissa said that she's got like, I don't know, man, you said 50 or 500, like a ton of languages at her school. Um, and so I think most of us have a, a portion of English learners um, 
and they get really, yeah, they just, they, they can sometimes I feel like be really actually proficient at English, even if they're English learners, but for some reason inside of their math class, when they see English, their filter just flies right up. Um, you and your students will be able to like make cool connections between all of the, the stuff that you're, you're doing. Um, and not just the stuff that you're doing like the, the year you're teaching them, but you can make all these cool connections um, back to two years before. And, and maybe uh, if you're teaching eighth graders, you can touch back on ratio reasoning all the time, which is like huge in sixth grade. Um, also important in seventh grade. And then the last one is like probably what your administrators want, which is like those smarter balanced tasks at the end of the year are super difficult. And, um, but like probably more importantly for us, cause we're like the cool math teachers, right? Um, like fun math problems are difficult and you need to, to help your students like build up the perseverance or the grid or whatever word you want to use um, to do those problems. And, and I think these low floor, high ceiling tasks are a great way to, to help them build that confidence and that perseverance to be able to, to get through them. All right, so we are already 30 minutes into it, plus the delay. Um, and I've only gone through the first part. So I was thinking maybe everybody look at these discussion prompts real quick, but I don't think we'll have enough time for too many people to share out. So maybe. Um, I think Christina, a Christina has a question over in the chat. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, Sam, I just, uh, I wrote it to everybody, um, but I mean, it's mainly to you. I just asked if you use this structure for your whole class or just the first part of class. And if you find yourself using it daily, once a week, or, you know, just how, how often. That's an awesome question. Thank you. Sorry, I don't, I'm not good at this technology stuff. I will be completely honest. At least the Zoom, I should say. Um, the, I have, so we are block periods. And so I see my students um, for Tuesday is like a weird day, but basically the other four days are block periods, but I see my students every other day. Um, so basically I do these once a week. Um, and I do them inside of an hour and 40 minute period. And we dedicate probably like to the whole thing, probably an hour, right? Like from the warm up to the discussion, to my students going up to the boards and actually working on their problems. Um, yeah, so I know I, I think I said like, I'm, I'm not great at this yet, but I think just to be super specific, I think the, the piece that I'm working on most and concentrating on improving most is the discussion part. Um, I think I'm really good at targeting those warm ups or those problem sets to sort of, once again, like prime their brain in the right direction. Um, and then I think the discussion sometimes it just feels like a little like it's like I'm either pushing it too quick or it feels too slow and it's just like grinding. Um, but then once my kids get up to the board, like um, like some magical stuff starts to happen. And, and some of the later slides talk about all of that as well. Did that answer your question, Christina? Yeah, it did. And I'm curious about like the, the board part, but it sounds like that'll come up naturally. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just, I mean, honestly, because we're out low on time, um, is there anyone that has another question or something they really want to share out on? I just don't want to, I just don't want it to look up and, and see that an hour and a half has gone by and see I got through half of this stuff. Diana. Um, I just, I'm having like great success with popsicle sticks. And I know that sounds really silly, but I put each of their names on a popsicle stick, but I don't draw the popsicle sticks. So we do like a, what you notice not wonder in your group and then I have a one student per class like pull the popsicle stick and then that person can share out something they heard or said so I'm not calling on students and that's that's so huge like all of the stress of like oh my gosh McLean's gonna pick on me it's like nope it's completely random I'm not in charge and it's working really well is there anyone else that would like to share a strategy or or anything else All right. Well, I, I'm not hearing anyone, so I'm going to assume that we're all good and I'm going to move forward in the presentation.
and I'm going to ask Elizabeth or Diana to at any point tell me if somebody has a question in case I'm missing it again. I apologize for that, Christina. That was an awesome question. Okay, so here, here is like, here's what I want to really open up to you guys, right? So this is where the presentation starts to flip. So all of this stuff does tie into low floor, high ceiling tasks. Like I really think that um, as I'm sure most of you guys agree, like a classroom is like a giant living organism and everything is like connected. Um, so these are all connected to low floor, high ceiling tasks, but I am going to sort of shift into like, I guess what I feel I have to really share with you and hopefully, um, I don't know, hopefully you just feel like this was time well spent, I guess. Um, so uh, I just want to be clear that like I'm going to, this gets a little bit hippy dippy because that's just sort of how I am. Um, so students that feel cared for will have a higher degree of participation with lower effective filters. Students that have a sense of inclusion inside of your mathematics community will develop the perseverance to work on these tasks. Getting your students up to the boards will increase engagement and help you provide feedback to them and finding new ways of providing the necessary information that your students need in order to make discoveries will help your students with low floor high ceiling tasks. So those are the things I'm going to talk about next. And I just wanted to be clear about how I think that they are all connected to low floor high ceiling tasks or are just learning in general in your classroom. So um, I don't know if any of you guys have developed a personal vision for yourself as a math as a math teacher or just as a teacher in general, because I know like Brian, once again, is doing um, computer science, which is mathy, but um, I mean, science is in the title. Um, so I know that a lot of us teach other subjects. So maybe just uh, as a teacher in general, um, I did this for myself and it does change. Um, but I find it like really powerful. Um, so, and you don't even have to share it with anybody. Like, I think honestly, this is the first time I've shared it with like, definitely the first time I've shared it with like a, uh, like officially at like a meeting or something like that. Um, and I find it really powerful and it grounds me and it just helps me sort of like how Diana said, there's a lot of things outside of her classroom that, uh, affect her teaching. Um, I find that if you, if you carve out a vision for yourself, it really helps cut all of that nonsense out and it helps you just concentrate on what matters every day. So my personal vision is to provide unconditional love for my students while engaging them in exploring mathematics. Furthermore, to provide opportunities for my students that they would not have if I were not in their lives. So the first piece is exactly what it sounds like the same unconditional love that I have for my family members. Um, these relationships are very different than relationships with your family because you're stuck with your family forever. But like um, the most amount of time I have with one of these kids is three years. And that's a pretty rare example where I get to have a kid for sixth, seventh and eighth grade. It has happened and it's pretty special, um, but it's rare. So these are temporal relationships, um, but I do view them as extremely authentic and that unconditional love is real. Um, now, it's not enough for me just to be like their dad because that's not who I am and that's not my role in the classroom. Um, so I do provide that unconditional love, but that second part of the sentence is, is completely true, right? Like we are doing math all the time, always. And I'm like not, I'm like not even that cool. Like we don't do like, um, like I'm a middle school teacher, <clears throat> excuse me, right? And like, I don't do like those little foldables or like we don't do art in my class. Um, and I'm sure like right now, some of you guys are like, you need to do foldables, you need to do art in your class. And you're probably totally right. Um, but I just want to be clear that like, I, I do provide this atmosphere of unconditional love. Um, but I'm not like a teacher that has free time and plays movies and stuff like that. Cause I, I've, I have seen those types of teachers and I do think that they are, they really care for their students, but they're not doing anything academically for their students. Um, and the second sentence is just what it sounds like, right? Like as in, um, yeah, like when they're with me for seventh grade, um, I hope that I push them to apply for a couple programs that 
maybe their other seventh grade teachers don't push them to apply for or help them get into community college for the summer to take a free math class or a free art class or whatever. So I literally just to provide opportunities for my students that they would not have. Um, I guess another way to say that is just go like above and beyond what I'm asked to do as a teacher. Um, I just wanted to share that I did go to UCLA for grad school and Professor Cooper taught me about the culture of care. Um, I know I use that phrase unconditional love. He uses the, the term culture of care. There's a link to his article here. Um, he's an amazing, amazing person. He did this article with, uh, I think, Professor Chigui. And, um, and it's just, it was really cool. And it really helped me see that I need to attach academic expectations to my students um, while showing them care. So it's like I have to use this care almost as a vehicle to deliver academics um, and make my students like perform. Um, all right, so this, I think Christina, um, I think, I don't know if this is Christina's first child, but if it is, I think this video is gonna hit you really strong. Um, and then I know there's some younger teachers and some teachers that don't have children yet, so I think um, hopefully you really like this. Hey, My wife and I had hey. our first child a year and a half ago, and I've always been very nervous about how this would affect me as a teacher. Will I still be as good of a teacher now that I have my own child? Will I still go above and beyond offering opportunities to my students? Will I be able to figure out this delicate balance between work life and family life? And will it make me a worse teacher? But what I found is the opposite. It's made me a better teacher than I ever thought I could be. It's made me realize how important each of these children are. Now I have my own family and my own child, and I see an even greater sense of importance for teachers to show care for their students. And then watching your child, night after night, throw the food that you just prepared for him on the floor and then laugh about it will make you a much more patient teacher. And any teacher that wants to spend their career in middle school understands that patience is the most important thing because we need to see all of our students, just like our own children, graduate middle school, prepared for high school and the world beyond. All right, so I made that video um, using Spark Video, which um, is a really cool app that actually Diana showed me and taught me how to use. And you can, I, I do it a lot to make um, story problems for my kids or what you notice, what you wonder, um, like prep problems for my kids when I go to the grocery store or I'm out, like basically anytime I see something that I think I could relate to class, I pull out my phone, I take a bunch of pictures, and then I make a spark video on it. Um, this is, I ask my kids just these three questions. What do you like about class? What do you not like about class? And what's something funny uh, or interesting or another comment about the class? And once again, because of time, I'm just gonna play one of these, but I really liked what Kelvin said. The first thing about this class is that the two captains show. And my least favorite thing is that the work is too easy. The, and it, it, a comment about this class is that after being after in this class. All right, is that it? Yeah. So I don't know, it's sort of hard to hear, but Kelvin said, I feel free. Um, and that just made me feel really nice. All right. So um, once again, for time, maybe we'll just. Uh, take a minute to prep and just I'll ask like two or three people if they're comfortable to share out. Um, here's a couple things to think about um, if you're comfortable sharing. I guess I've never really thought about it as my teaching vision, but since I teach a lot of the remedial courses, uh, my biggest goal is to get my students to not be afraid of math anymore. I'm dealing with non-traditional students. Sometimes they're coming back to school after 40 or 50 years, 
and they are in our lowest level course, which is teaching them arithmetic, working with fractions, and they are terrified of coming in. And I've had so many students by the end of the time, just by encouraging them and exactly what Sam is saying, showing them caring and that I'm there to help them and they get through the course and they are just so relieved and so excited that they're not scared of math by the time they leave my course. And I think that's one of the biggest things we can do is make sure kids aren't scared of math. Uh, Sam, just in the comments, people want to make sure that they'll have access, like you'll share this slide, the slide deck with them. I assume, Elizabeth, this whole, is this whole thing going to be posted? Uh, yeah, we're going to post the whole video, and then if you want to send me your slides, we'll actually post just your slides so people can read through those as well. Yeah, and then there's, that's good because there's lots of like live links in the slides in case yeah. people can, like, look more at some of these things. Is there anybody else that feels comfortable sharing. I know this is like, maybe not what you're expecting to have to think about on Saturday morning. Um, I, oh. oh, go ahead. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I just want to share uh, about a caring thing. Uh, yesterday, like seven of my students came back to school after three years. I taught them, um, they were eighth graders. So they were able to go to specialized high school and sometimes you wouldn't know if the students really grateful of what you've showed them it will just come to you like later on oh miss spiritu i am so thankful to you now i am i'm in a specialized high school and i i think i have a lot of opportunities and way back when i taught in the philippines like 20 years ago i have already students working abroad as engineers as teachers as in, you know different profession in Middle East and they would um, message you through Facebook so sometimes we would just feel so sad that how are these people you know not even saying hello hey hello but you know there was a time when they feel like oh they realize that oh because of this teacher the care the hard work that she did for us I would not be here because of that person. So, sometimes I feel like these students are so ungrateful. Like, you know, your current students, like after working so hard for your, with your lesson plan and so prepared, and then no one would thank you at the end of the day. But you would not always get the thank you message, at, you know, right after you teach them. You would get it later on when they are so successful. Thank you. Thanks. I was just going to say off of what Liz was saying and also what Irene was saying, in terms of teaching being more of a, a perception and an environment and how you create that environment, I don't think it's exclusive just to the math classroom. But as you were saying, Sam, in terms of just letting them know you care, uh, is really an important piece in our classrooms because they may not even get that at home. And so in many cases, the school is a safe place. And if we can make it a safe place to learn, uh, all the better. And so I think it, it's mainly about a perception. Uh, letting the students know that, that you care, but also not coddling them so that you're, they're building a thicker skin. They're not going to be thin-skinned individuals when they're done with your class. So, uh, so that's one of my perceptions of, of a classroom. Um, yeah, I really like how you said, sorry, Christina, and then you'll go. I just really like how you said and not coddle them. And that's um, like I show unconditional love the same way my parents did. And it was like, uh, like I'm, I moved out, like I went to college, I moved out, I'm on my own. That was the goal of my family. And there wasn't, there was a lot of love in there, but like, um, like, I totally agree with you on that. I just wanted to say that. That was really good. Christina, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, uh, so, especially being in middle school, I feel like I've heard a lot that, and it's true, that relationships are more important than the content that you teach. And I've heard a lot of people say things like, um, don't think I teach math, think I, th I teach students. Do you know what I mean? Like, just that perception of, like, your focus is on transmitting something and building a relationship with the individual as opposed to just carrying out your content. 
And I mean, that's been a big, like I've heard that for years, but it's been one of those things that it's taken me a lot of time to like really like infuse into my teaching, teaching, you know, kids before teaching content. I think for single subject teachers, it's a big deal. You know, like I think we go in because we love content, also because we love kids, but I, I think, you know, just shifting that focus has been a really big thing for me and is part of my philosophy, philosophy now. Awesome. Thank you. I'm, rel I'm reminded a lot about um, the discussions around growth mindset too, um, especially with like the high expectations, trying to get students to, I don't know, realize that their hard work is important, um, the process and not just like getting the right answer sort of thing. So fostering that sort of thinking is really important to me as a teacher. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move forward once again due to time. Okay, so at PCMI, we would do um, morning math, and you can see like a little sample. This is actually from Math with Daryl, but it's a, uh, it may actually be the same exact problems. Um, and we all know how intimidating doing something new and, or difficult can be. Um, and we all know how this feeling can be exacerbated when there are various levels of knowledge amongst the group. Um, I was going to sort of go into more detail here, but I think almost everybody's been to PCMI. Um, I think there was a couple people when they introduced didn't say they had attended PCMI, or maybe just one. Um, so real quickly, in case you haven't been there, we do actual math sets in the morning, and um, the math sets are are difficult um they're they're fun and they're really cool but they're they're definitely it's not like we're doing so me as a middle school teacher it's not math that my middle schoolers would do right it's 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 math it's more appropriate for math majors um so the vision for morning math and the program in general is super positive and it's meant to like minimize the feeling of intimidation despite the fact that you're working on like really difficult math or what I view as really difficult math. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I value my experience that I brought from Math for America Los Angeles because we do math with Daryl, and it is a very similar format. The problems are super similar, and the format is um, format and vision for that program is the same as in to like minimize that idea of intimidation and math should be fun, and you're exploring these problems together in a group. And it's not, there's no, there's no expectation over what you finish, um, which is really cool too. Um, so anyway, so I do morning math um, and it was difficult and I had like those feelings of intimidation, like, like I, I'm too embarrassed to ask for help, um, you know, like all, all those things. And I just, I really thought like, if I feel this way, um, what do my kids feel like? in my room because I'm a math teacher and um, I didn't major in math, um, but I, uh, I've been doing math for a long time. Math was always the, the course in school that I felt most comfortable in. Um, and yeah, so like if somebody that has all of that math confidence can feel so um, intimidated, I guess is the word I keep using, um, then what do my kids feel like? Because man, the levels in my room are like crazy, like compared to the levels inside of morning math. Um, yeah, I mean, I have, I have students that still don't understand um, the relationship between addition and multiplication. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know, the, the levels are all over the place. Um, so hey, I made another Spark video talking about this. Before I attended PCMI, I thought I really understood my students and could relate to what they were going through on a daily basis inside of my classroom doing mathematics. I felt I had built good community and that all of my students were very comfortable doing mathematics inside of my classroom. And then I went to PCMI morning math and there's me on the left and there's my table mates on the right, a middle school teacher with no math degree matched up with many high school teachers that majored in mathematics. To me, this math was very challenging 
and at times it seemed almost impossible. But this experience paired with quality reflection time allowed me to grow as a teacher. This opportunity allowed me to realize that even when my students have one-on-one -on -one help, they can still feel isolated in the classroom. Even when I show my students how much I care and create structures for them to learn, that is not always enough for an individual to feel included in a mathematics community. My experience at PCMI has shown me that it is my responsibility in the classroom to make sure that every single student feels included. I now see that providing all of my students the sense of inclusion is a fundamental structure inside of my classroom that cannot be ignored. Okay, um, I just wanted to real quickly say this. Um, I think about every three to five years, I look back like three to five years and I think like, wow, I was doing something completely wrong. Um, I thank goodness I've never looked back and thought like every single piece I did was incorrect. Um, but I do always like reflect back at least at this portion of my career and I always um, find that I'm, I'm growing a lot and changing a lot. So I guess I just wanted to share that because I'm sharing a lot of like things I feel really strongly about right now in 2018. But um, I'm sure if I'm lucky enough to do like another PCMI reconnect in 2021, um, there are some, it's going to look a lot different. And maybe there's even pieces of this that I'll be very critical of um, now when I have the chance of uh, reflecting and looking back over time. Um, these student testimonials, I'm not even going to play them. Um, they're both actually negative testimonials about my class. They're, they're not like super like mean or anything. Um, but these are two students that showed that they still don't feel a complete sense of inclusion inside of my classroom. Um, even though that has been like a super heavy focus point for me this year is to make sure that every single kid feels included and feels like, um, I'm doing everything that I can within my power to make the environment one in which they feel comfortable learning. Um, so I was wondering if I guess is a good time to stop and chat, but also if anybody wants to share out about any of these things. And I know a lot of you guys have been in math for America and, um, yeah, I'm just wondering, or sorry, not Math for America, but PCMI, and also Math for America. Um, but from PCMI, I was wondering what your guys' feelings were from morning math and how you reflected on that, took it back to your kids, or just in general, or maybe outside of school, a time you felt intimidated. Sam, it might be helpful to know that um, the invitation for this presentation only went out to PCMI alum, so everybody here has been to PCMI. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sorry for not sharing that with no, you. No, no, no. I should have. It's called PCMI Reconnect. I guess I should have. Yeah. No, no, but it's, yeah, it's good to know. I mean, we, you know, we do like to be inclusive, and we've talked about opening it up to people who've never been so they can experience this, but we haven't, we haven't done that yet. Right. Sam? Yes. This is Gail. I live in Norfolk, Virginia. I didn't get a chance to introduce myself. I was at PCMI 2012, 2013, 2014. And I've since retired, but I wanted to tell you that when I worked, I worked in an urban middle school with students who felt very unsuccessful in math. Um, and what you're saying really does work. You just have to be persistent with it. And in the very beginning, nobody wants to share what they notice because they think they don't notice anything. So you're on the exact right track about asking them those questions and getting them to supply questions to problems. When they start feeling like, oh, I own the math, the math doesn't own me, it makes such a difference. It, it just takes a long time. And by middle school, they have already learned these behaviors of, um, I, I don't know, I can't do it. So you have to break all that down and I really appreciate everything you're sharing today. Even though I'm retired, I still enjoy listening to it. 
Uh, I appreciate that. Did anyone else want to share? Um, I could share if that's all right. Definitely. Um, so with um with Math for America San Diego, I would say that, and you know, uh, Jen and Trang, just let me know what you think on this. I, I think we're it's the math that we have done is really, really rigorous pretty much all the time. And I know that when I joined in, the first two summers worth were all about um, constructions and geometry. And honestly, I had never learned constructions in school at all, like in high school and college, nothing. So I felt very much like intimidated pretty much for two years in a row, um, like, like that I didn't deserve to be there kind of a thing. So um, just, that just really connected me to this experience. And PCMI, um, I felt did a really amazing job of, of like minimizing that kind of stress that you can have. So, and I liked that it was okay at PCMI not to um, know everything. Like I even remember asking in a Zoom session, should I be researching matrices right now? Because I haven't used matrices in forever and people told me, no, no, you should really kind of like figure it out organically and that's valuable. So I liked that a lot. Awesome. Thank you. I want to share. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I was, I felt the same way. Like when I was doing that and I could not get the answer right away, I was shy to ask questions. And I was thinking of my students who were left out when I was giving them problem. And I think maybe this is only uh, an idea that we should establish a, an environment that is so friendly for the children or for the students and so that they will not feel judged like, oh, you know nothing or you know less. Like sometimes uh, I think all of us felt that, I don't know if any one of you would disagree that we had that feeling sometimes when we could not solve the problem with the rest of, you know, the, the members of the team, we felt like left out, right? And I don't know if you agree with me that if we have that feeling, we, we feel isolated and sometimes we lose confidence and suddenly, but when somebody would work with you, I think being able to monitor that you are not, you know, you are working with somebody that, or being aware if you are the facilitator, uh, make sure that you don't, see anybody like working by himself so that that person would not feel isolated or left alone even with our kids we know if the student is not with working with the other kids in the in the team they feel isolated and they would just act up just you know as a reason because of not being able to catch up so i i don't know you you give your comment about that if any one of you has not felt that kind of feeling that you felt left out. Irene, I really appreciate that. I was just saying, like in the comments, like it's so much easier to offer help than ask for help. And if students can recognize that, that's really powerful. Cool. So I'm gonna move forward just because of time. I apologize if there's somebody else that that was just about to start talking. Um, the next part of my presentation, I know somebody asked, was uh, is, is about getting your kids up to the boards, which I honestly think is directly tied in to doing low floor, high ceiling tasks. Um, so here's just a little Spark video that I made, once again. I've been teaching for 13 years, and I've definitely had some classes that felt like going to the dentist's office. Well, maybe not as bad as having your tooth pulled, but definitely as painful as a cleaning. One solution I found is getting my students up out of their seats and at the whiteboards. Sometimes I have them working in teams of four, and sometimes they just work with a partner. My students thrive on the social aspect of getting up and going to the boards with their friends or somebody new. Having your students go to the boards will allow you to see your entire class's work in a shorter amount of time. And at the same time, it will allow you to focus on the students that need your attention. 
And at a bare minimum, my students get to get out of their seats and up at the boards and a chance to move around a little bit. All right, so um, Classroom 360 is the first time I heard of this. Was, I think Ed Campos was the guy who talked about it at like CMC North, I think is where I saw him. Um, at, at PCMI, they called it Non-Permanent Vertical Spaces. Um, it is amazing. So um, I actually just have whiteboards all over my um, my school, we had a bunch of bungalows on our campus that were marked to get torn down. So I asked my principal if I could bring my power tools in and take them all down and put them in my room until the district could come hang them up. And I did that and it only took like six to eight months for the district to come hang them up, but whatever. So now my classroom is full of whiteboards. Um, so literally the entire class can get up and do a problem like every single student can work it is um this is not my classroom that you're looking at this is actually a picture from the internet um but this uh my classroom has like even more space like the kids are not not this tight i'm very lucky i have a i have the largest classroom on our campus um and i think i use it in the right way um so I really love getting my kids up to the boards to do these low floor high ceiling tasks and to do all sorts of other stuff. Um, here's a quick example of what it actually looks like in my room. This is a video from last year. So um, that was a video of the class that I had the hardest time engaging last year. Um, and I would go up to the board and lecture for like a planned like five minute lecture. Literally, I would try to get it down to that short. And a minute into it, I would look up and I lost them all. Um, and as you can see, it's not like perfect by any means. There was a like probably seven or eight students that looked disengaged because they were sitting and, and not, they didn't look like they were doing anything other than sitting and watching. Um, but the engagement went up, I would say from like 20% to 80%, which is like a huge shift when I just started getting them up to the boards last year. Um, oops, that's not what was supposed to happen. There we go. So anyways, um, these vertical non-permanent spaces, if you don't have them, do it. Do it as soon as possible. Um, Diana was nice enough to put a link right here for a good product that she uses that is not super duper expensive. Um, but don't spend your own money, man. Like advocate for your kids. Like, don't even say it's for me. It's for your students because it is. Go to your administrators and, and make them buy these for your classroom. And I also heard that command strips are really good if you're gonna get these ones because these are like um, basically thick laminated whiteboards that you're gonna hang on your wall. Um, but they're nice because they're light and you can put them on like anywhere. Um, and I think you can get them with coordinate planes too, which is really nice. I need to actually get some with coordinate planes. Um, use structures and have clear expectations. There are lots of structures to use. Um, PCMI definitely demonstrated a few different structures this summer to us. One structure I really like is um, a group of four. Each kid has a different color marker. And when I come by to check with the group, I'm gonna ask you about another student's problem. And that's just one structure that I use. That's definitely not the structure I use every day, but that's a really nice one. So once again, each kid, different color marker. And when I come up to your group and I have a chat with you, I'm gonna ask you about someone else's work. Um, buy an inexpensive pack of microfiber cloths. Once again, I got that from Diana. Um, the whiteboard erasers that your school buys or you buy at like Staples or whatever, they fall apart super fast. They don't work that good. 
um, buy those microfiber cloths and don't, don't like try to get like a really expensive pair just, or, or pack, just make sure it's microfiber and see what's least expensive and get those. They're really nice because you don't have to spray the board. You can just wipe it and it goes back to like perfectly clean. Um, buy a set of erasable coordinate planes um, because your kids graph and you want them to be able to graph. Um, so like if you're gonna go for this, make sure you don't just have whiteboards up there, but have graphs up there too, because you don't wanna be like, man, this would be fun to do up at the boards, but I can't because it's graphing. Um, a good tip I got from Ed Compost is store the markers tip down, gravity matters, and that will get a little more life out of those markers. Um, number six, I really like. Um, I actually got this from Avid, which, um, Avid's cool but it's definitely not the silver bullet. Um, but anyways, Avid taught me to like, just ask questions and don't wait for answers. So like when you're facilitating, when they're at the boards, like one of the worst things you can do is get stuck in one spot. Or at least I feel like right now, one of the worst things you can do is get stuck in one spot. So ask that question that you think is gonna provoke the thought that that student needs and then keep walking to the next group and then just keep going around because you're gonna be right back to that student if you're doing it. If you're moving fast enough, you're gonna be back to that student within minutes and you're gonna be able to ask him that question again and see what he thinks now. Um, or perhaps you can see that that question provoked the thought that you wanted and that student has progressed further in the problem. Um, or maybe you notice that the student's not, that didn't think about the question and you need to dedicate another minute of conversation to that student before you move on. Um, number seven is a little confusing maybe. So build capacity with patience, but make your goal very transparent. So my goal is for me to like not have to be in the classroom. And that is transparent to my students, like as in the knowledge is in the room and it's on the internet and inside of their textbooks. And I don't even need to be there. And that is my goal. Um, and this board work, it helps me get to that goal of making my students realize they completely own their education and they don't need teachers. And I know that's like a scary thing for teachers to hear, um, but it takes a long time. Like they, the truth is they need teachers for like at least until the end of high school, um, probably until the end of college, I don't know. Um, but they do need teachers because they're not ready to learn on their own yet. But that is the goal, right? For me at least. Um, and then number eight is a phrase that I use a lot because some of my students just don't get started. So I say like, just start. And the worst case scenario is you're wrong. And, and usually I say next, sometimes like, like, like it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if you're, you're wrong or like, I, I don't care. Like this, this isn't a test and we're just doing problems at the board. And then I like to follow like with someone will help. And I like to say like, someone will help, not I will help. Um, because once again, the knowledge is in the room, the help is there, just start, get some stuff up on the board. Um, and literally the worst thing that can happen is that you're incorrect. And I'm, I've been saying that for a semester and now we're in second semester and it's starting to show. Um, like some of the students are really starting to, to um, internalize that feeling of like it, it we're just practicing math and being right or wrong is not the most important thing um sort of going back to brian and and uh the all the growth mindset stuff which i'm totally like i drink the growth mindset kool-aid 100 percent um in that like you praise the process right and the process is going up to the boards in this case and, and trying some stuff and you don't praise um you don't praise the product which is uh, I guess in this case, a correct problem. Um, yeah, so I will play maybe one clip here. Um, my favorite thing about this test is to go up the boards because I think if I go up and I don't know, another um, question, um, another student could help me and could help me do the work. My least favorite thing about this class is to do test moves. Um, I really do not like enjoy like to do test moves. Um, I think that my class is like funny 
All right. Um, so as you can see, Jackie really likes going up to the boards. I had like, out of all those student testimonials, I had so many that like their favorite thing was going to the boards. Um, so it looks like for time-wise, we are pretty, um, pretty, pretty close to the end here. Yeah, Christine. Quick question. Um, yeah. Do students, when they're posting those testimonials, just do that with iPhones or how did they get them to you? Okay, so I used to do like a weekly, like that weekly written. And what I convinced my class this year that that to do for me is um, to do them the same thing, but do them on video because um, it's just so much more enjoyable for me to sit on my couch and watch like <laughs> videos in a row of my kids telling me what they like and don't like about class than sitting and reading um, their their little um, notes. And then also a lot of times on their notes, I can't, I can't read their handwriting and I'm, um, I'm, I'm having a hard time interpreting what they're writing because those are usually things that I try to do quickly in class. So anyways, to answer your question, I use my iPhone and like a kid goes and does, like I like ask a kid and I rotate um, like, hey, Robert, can you go do my videos for me today? And he goes like into the corner of the room and calls kids one at a time and they, they respond. So it's once a week then, or it's more frequent than that? No, it's, it's, I'd say like once every two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Like worst case scenario, it's once a grading period, which is one, a month. We do grades every month. But yeah, I think it's, uh, it really helps me and it's really fun. Um, I used to use a program called Let's Recap um, that uses their Chromebooks, but it was just, um, I just found that, this, that to do it like that was way easier, more convenient for me. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments about going to the boards? Just because I want to make sure that um, I get through this, this next part. And then the last piece I think most of you guys know about because you're at PCMI, but I just want to run through a couple things on the web. Sam, how often do you have them go to the boards? Okay, boards every day. So like um, Tuesdays are short periods, um, as in they're only an hour long but every other day is an hour and 40 minutes. So there are occasional Tuesdays where we don't get up to the board, um, but that's pretty rare. That's usually like a Tuesday where I'm assessing them and giving them like a long assessment where it's like, yeah, maybe some students only need like 25 minutes, but like I do have some students that like to really take their time on an assessment and they'll, they'll use the full hour. And they're not like those students that are like dragging their heels like, or whatever, they're like actually engaged and making sure that they get every problem right um, during that hour. So yeah, I try to do it every day, man. I think out of all of these things, that's the most, I think it's like the most powerful, honestly, out of all of these things, like getting your students up at the boards. Um, I think that's what I've gotten the most bang for my buck with. And Sam, just to follow up, like, there's pressure to have like these open tasks at the boards. Like, is it always a super open task or? Like oh no, we do like procedural problem sets at the board. We do, yeah, no, we just, I try to like, um, yeah. So like, we'll do like an open task, let's say like on Thursday and Friday, and then like Monday and Wednesday, they may go up to the boards and um, like my seventh graders have been practicing still like, I wanna make sure that everyone understands that five minus 12 is negative seven. And then like, once again, like, this is the new Mr. Kaplan and it's like, everyone means everyone. And like, I'm just differentiating and making sure like I'm not dragging the whole class through things they know every day, but like, I'm going to make sure every kid in that class knows that negative seven minus eight is negative 15. Right. Um, which is not like super hard. Right. And I'm good at teaching that. And it just takes some kids like literally a month to develop their own algorithm to do that. But as we all know, like if those kids go to algebra and they think they, they can't do X minus six X, like they're in big trouble. Right. And I, I view that as like a really big thing. And, and fractions is another one of those skills where like, I'm going to make sure every kid can do it. Um, and I really stick with it. And the boards are a great way. So for example, like last week, I would do what's called a progress check, which is three quick questions to see who can do this thing or not. The kids that that need help, they go to the boards and practice for 20 minutes. And the other group um, worked on like uh, a, a separate activity. So I split the class 
And then I go and I help the kids that are still struggling on that integer addition and subtraction. Um, while the other kids have like a more, um, as you'll see actually from my next couple slides, they have like a uh, completely self-directed, like something that they don't need me for. Um, yeah. Are there any more questions? Cool. So I'm going to sort of whip through this real quick. Um, sorry for speeding up. Irene had a question. Oh, sorry, Irene. It go for it. In the chat about what you do before they go up to the board for whiteboards for work to make sure you don't have any discipline issues. Oh, man, I'll be honest. Like, you're, like okay, if you have like a bad situation in your classroom, like bad community and like you feel like animosity between you and your kids, um, then like I would concentrate on a lot of other stuff that this, like I would concentrate on the front half of this PD and not so much structures to get your kids up to the whiteboard. Like, um, uh, like you, I don't have those issues. I just want to be completely honest. Like I, I feel like my classroom is super warm and I don't have discipline issues. Like I have middle schoolers that act like middle schoolers every day, right? Like they do, they have impulse control issues and whatnot, but like, I don't, I don't prep heavily for any of this stuff. I guess the one thing that I make sure I always do in my classroom is I make my expectations super clear. Like I'm really transparent and I'm really patient. And that means that sometimes I repeat my expectation to the same student like three times um, because they're not meeting my expectations. But I do find that like um, maybe with my sixth graders that two minutes of transition up to the boards is chaotic. But once I've done two laps around the room, every kid is working. Um, so I would, I would say as a teacher, if you're worried about um, like behavior, uh, the advice I would give you is move, just keep moving. Like once you get them up to the boards, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Um, don't stay in one spot because when you're looking at the board in one spot, um, your back is to a lot of kids. Um, I don't know if I answer, I've, uh, answered your question completely, Irene, but, um, that's the advice I have. Do you have a follow-up question, Irene? Oh, yeah. Sam, would you mind, uh, sharing what those expectations are? Yeah, right. So, like, it depends on the day. Um, so, uh, I'll think literally right back to the last class I taught, right? So, I, I did a progress check. And then like about 12 students were still struggling on adding and subtracting integers. And I said, my expectation is for you guys to go up to the board, pick at least seven problems each from this problem set and get them up at the board. And when I come by, I'm going to not just ask you what your uh, answers are, but what you were thinking about to arrive at your answer. Um, because the way I teach this is I, I teach them a really simple model that I call start direction distance model. And then I actually asked them to form their own algorithms to do that integer addition subtraction um, based off of being able to conceptually visualize what's happening with that integer addition or subtraction. Um, and then once again, like I just, then I circle, right? And I say that back to a few, and then right, of course, like half the class is how many problems again? How many problems? And it's also written for them. I use the Google Classroom um, in my class, so every, all the directions are, are up for every piece. Um, but like, yeah, they're middle schoolers. They don't read the directions or they read them too quick. And I repeat the same thing multiple times. And I just keep going in circles until I make sure that every student has done you know, what I feel. Because I'll be honest, I think I said seven problems. And I want to say about half of those students after I did like two laps, I looked at them and I said, how do you feel about this? Like, do you feel more comfortable? Or do you feel like, like you need to practice it more or do you want to sit down and work on something different? And they were like, I feel good. And I think um, I want to sit down and work on something different. And they did, right? So also, I guess I have like clear expectations, but then I do alter um, those all the time when I'm facilitating in my classroom. Are, did that answer your question? Are there any other questions about um, the boards? Because this is actually a really important piece of my class, I think. And it's definitely like something that, at least last summer, PCMI was pushing um, 
I felt like it was pushing us heavily to try to do. Yeah, um, based on uh, your explanation, uh, you have uh, students, really good students. I have students like, they judge each other right away upon seeing the question, like upon seeing the answer, like, oh, that's so wrong. Oh, you're so dumb. Like, these things would suddenly just pop up. So what I did last, I had a very difficult class, and I have to tell them, this is what your, uh, this will be, you know, the standard behavior when you're doing this. When somebody gave an incorrect answer, you will not say you're sorry. You just say, oh, I have a different answer. Just say different answer. Don't judge the student. And then you are not judging each other. So these little things, I think they help because students don't know how to conduct themselves sometimes in a setting like that. They don't know because no one teaches them at home because when they get home, I have you know, students living in a shelter house, you know, I have students when they get home, the families are not there. I have students, like their parents are working two jobs. So no one is teaching them, like they are in authority. So I, I teach in Brooklyn, East New York. So they are really challenging. And I have to really set a standard behavior whenever we have an activity. And I'm so happy for you that you have, you know, nice kids. But in my case, I really have like, I have, a standard behavior that they should be you know doing when they're doing any activity like even though they're holding manipulatives you know when I do it that with manipulatives they just suddenly you will just see things being thrown up on air so what do you do with this you're not going to throw it these are the things you're gonna do with this you have to really like what you said expectation clear expectations but with their behavior mm -hmm. so it has to be accompanied always with their behavior, aside from the clear expectation of what they're supposed to, to produce or what they're supposed to do in terms of, you know, the content or the process. But in terms of behavior, it's always accompanied with the kind of students we have. But thank you for, you know, uh, the sharing. It, it, it really, you know, reminded me with a clear expectation about what they're supposed to do clearly because sometimes when we give unclear unclear instruction or direction it can also cause chaos and discipline issues uh -huh. oh, oh you didn't tell us to do that no it's not there in your direction it right. can also cause that yeah definitely and i would say like that the the long the video that you saw of the class from last year in my actual classroom um like once again, I'd say like I had 20% of those students and after I got them up to the board, I had like 80% of them. Um, and so I would say that like, if you have like a class that's in their seats and you feel like you're not reaching like even half of them, then I would say like, try it, try getting them up to the boards because um, let's say you go from half to like 65% of your class, that's a, that's a big improvement. Um, but you are right, like there are students that, um, like for instance, in that video of that class, there are students that it was day after day of, of um, yeah, they, they would make choices that disappointed me. Um, but then also I would say last year was the first year I did it, and this is the second year I did it, and it feels a lot better, um, just like everything else in teaching. So hey, I just wanna whip through, because I know we're like out of time already. I'm sorry for, for going too slow, guys. Um, so the last piece is just refusing to lecture. Um, so you can see me on the left, you can see them on the right. Um, I really got this idea also from um, PCMI in that there was just so many people around me with the iPad Pro and the Apple, Apple Pencil is what it's called. Um, so I bought one and I bought the pencil and I've been making a, a lot of my own videos. I've also been using um, YouTube to make videos. And um, then I've also just discovered this new program, maybe you guys have heard of it, called Ed Puzzle. And I can take my videos or YouTube videos and I can um, add questions in them. So basically the video stops and asks them a question. And I use those just as like, um, just to make sure they're watching, right? So let's say um, I'm explaining um, a right triangle, right? And I, and I set it up ABC, 
and then I say C is the hypotenuse of the right triangle, then I would pause the video and I'd say, which side is the hypotenuse of the right triangle? And there'd be three options, A, B, or C, and they have to answer before they can continue watching. And then I get all of that data so I can sort of see like, oh, if a kid got less than 50% or, or whatever my expectation is, then there's most likely they were just like playing the video and their mind was in another place. Um, so I do this because lecturing at the boards, my kids just seem so bored of it. Also, um, those lectures are out there. They're already on YouTube or I can record a nice one on my iPad and, um, and it's there forever. Um, students love them because they can access them over and over again. Um, the, the big issue is that the same, same way that students don't listen to you at the board, sometimes students don't watch the videos or they, the same way that students look at you while you're talking at the board but aren't really processing, they can also look at a video while it's playing and not really process it. So it's definitely not like a silver bullet, but um, I've stuck with it all year. I have not done one lecture at the board. Um, the first two weeks were a little rough. My kids were not happy, um, which is funny, but now it's, it's working out really well. I use the application Doceri on my iPad. It is a free application. Um, yeah, so I'm, I don't even know. I think as a time, I'm not even going to play the sample of my lecture. It just sort of shows you what it looks like. If you've ever been to Khan Academy before, it's similar to what those videos look like. Um, if you don't pull videos off of YouTube. I encourage you to. There's there's a bunch of them out there. Some of them have really nice production value, and a lot of them are just people like you and me talking at a whiteboard. But they're good math teachers doing decent math problems in a decent manner. Um, so yeah. Um, and then these two kids are just going to talk about how they like the videos. And I think one of them says they like it because um, they can watch it as many times as they want, which I think is something really good about those. Um, I'm gonna actually blow through this discussion real quick, and I just wanna make sure that, um, that I wanna really end with this, right? So if you're not one-to-one -one with technology, um, like push your administrative team to, to get that for you. And um, yeah, I know like people, I don't know if you guys think I teach at like a magnet school for gifted and talented or something, but I teach in the Pico Union area of Los Angeles. I teach at a neighborhood school. When I first got hired, we had 3,000 students. We are now at 800. So I am at one of the classic Los Angeles neighborhood schools, which has been dominated by encroach, encroaching charter schools in our area. And our population has shrunk from 3,000 to 800. So we are not a rich school, and I do not have... And students that come to my school come there for the most part because their parents don't um, realize all the school choice that they have. And, and, and my school is great. I love my school. I'm going to stay there forever. They're going to bury me in my school. Um, and we do good stuff. I'm not the only teacher there that cares. There's tons of caring teachers. It's a good school. But I do want to be clear that like most of the parents in our neighborhood that are, uh, know the systems, they, they use uh, magnets or they use... Um, charters for the most part. Um, we have a massive percentage of newcomers at our school. Um, real quick, uh, games are engaging, but they are the easiest, they are like uh, dangerous, okay? So there is one game that I like called Ratio Rumble. If you Google it, it'll take you right there. I'll fix that and put a link in there. Um, I know you guys all know about Desmos because you're all PCMI people. But one thing I do that maybe you guys don't do on your tech is arithmetic practice. There's a link to a really basic arithmetic practice webpage that my parent or my students use, excuse me, and they love it. And there is no lasers, there's no rocks blowing up. Like it's not a game, it's just arithmetic practice. We do it once a day for five minutes every single day, and my students love it. Um, if you have not seen which one doesn't belong, it is not the Sesame Street version. It is a great discourse tool and a great way for you to um, really, I guess, promote class discourse. I know Diana does it a lot more than me, so she could probably talk about that if we have a few minutes at the end. Number six, I do use a lot. That's Visual Patterns by Fawn Nguyen. Once again, I think most of you guys know about that website, but if you don't, please check it out. It's amazing. And the last one is Kahoot. Um, Kahoot is super popular at my school. 
I don't use it a ton um, just because um, whatever, just because there's only so many minutes. Like what I always need is more time with my kids. Um, I'm always like, that's cool. But um, my, my class is packed right now and every minute is used. Um, but it's a cool way to assess your kids um, formatively um, and it's really engaging for the kids. So we did it. We did it. I'm a little late, but we got to the end. Um, if you guys look at the last slide, in case you guys want, it's going to be like a bunch of references and links to stuff. I'll try to add maybe even a few more before I email, or I guess it's a Google slide, so I can change it whenever. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much. I apologize for going over 10 minutes. Thanks, um, Sam. This was fantastic. And I apologize if you guys were expecting an hour and a half of low floor, high ceiling tasks. So I know I talked about a lot of other stuff, but I promise like, I don't know. I just wanted to like uh, take this opportunity to like share with you guys the things that I really care about, like as a math teacher. And I think they're, they're just like things that I talk a lot with my department about. And I don't know, for a while I was thinking about becoming a principal. Like I got my administrative degree, but, um, I really don't want to do that um, and I really just want to teach forever but I want to feel like I'm like one of those math teachers that affected more than just their kids which is super powerful um, so I guess I appreciate all of you guys taking the time to listen to some of my ideas and hopefully um, yeah hopefully this had some effect on you as a teacher this is great thank you so much Sam um, I was gonna ask for a few things uh, to help us get wrapped up this will take us probably one or two more minutes we need to get a group picture. So Sam, if you don't mind turning off the screen sharing so we can um, get everyone's picture and just fix your hair really, you know, fix your hair so we can get a, a, a group pic. I'll do like a, a screen grab. Um, and if you don't have your camera on, you wanna be part of the group picture, you can just turn your camera on. Otherwise you can just leave it the way it is. Okay, all right. Now, I think we should all probably smile. <laughs> Hold on one second. All right, ready? All right, thank you. Um, the other thing is, um, if you have a Twitter handle, just type it into the group and in, into the group chat, and we can see each other's Twitter handles and find each other. Um, if you are interested in presenting, we're going to have a ten-minute teacher sharing, just like we do at PCMI. We're going to do it online on March third. If you're interested, type in the word present in the chat and we will get your name and contact you and work you in for a 10 minute teacher sharing on March 3rd, that's a Saturday morning just like this. Um, the next session is on February 10th. Henry Pachotto is doing Reaching the Whole Range. And if you want us to register you, you can just type in register me for um, the February 10th uh, next PCMI uh, teacher outreach session. And um, if you are applying to PCMI this summer, just type in 2018 in the chat window and we can find each other because I applied to uh, PCMI for the summer and I'm curious to see if anybody's familiar face is going to be there. Um, it's so much fun to see everybody. Thank you so much. Liz, was there anything, or Aisha, is there anything that you guys needed before we all turn our uh, Zoom's conferencing off? Could, could I ask a question at some point too before we all get out? I, th I think um, the question, if it's for Sam, we're going to save it until everybody's allowed to leave. Not and for Sam. Okay. Um, d just super quick, I posted something earlier in the chat, and it's, it says random. It's just like uh, a friend of mine is publishing stories by teachers, and so I'm not sure if people were able to see that in the chat, but there's like a link there with all the information. And will we have access to this chat after the fact, too? I believe the chats are recorded, but I'm not 100% positive. I know when I record it through Zoom, I know it's recording the screen. I hope it's recording the chat, but I act, honestly, I haven't watched through it enough to know if it did or not. Um, but I did see those. You might want to post those on our Facebook page. I don't think I'm even part of our Facebook page. We have one? Yeah, there's a TLP alum Facebook page. I will have to join that. Thank you. Okay. You can, also, we can, can uh, save the chat. Yeah if you click on the more button and then save chat. So there is a way to save the chat specifically, it looks like. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. I know we ran over, but this was just fantastic. 
Um, people that have come in the past have always said we feel re-energized when we come. So again, we have another one on February 10th, as Anne was saying with Henry. Uh, be looking out for a registration form. Some of you already pre-registered. It was available on all the previous ones. Uh, and uh, we'll talk to you then. Thanks so much for sharing your morning with us. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you.